does anyone does anyone not have the PowerPoint handout and you would like one? Lift your hand and perhaps we can. What's that? They're more on the piano. All right. So if you don't have the PowerPoint handout and you would like one, there are more on the piano. And um, since we have less than an hour left, what I'm going to do is accelerate and try to get a lot of content to you in a little bit of time. And I may skip a section or two as we deem um, necessary. You do have the PowerPoint uh, handout, and I, and I will do my best to not leave out anything that, that I, I, would, I would see as essential. Um, this will be a lot of information coming fairly, fairly quickly. And um, what we'll do is we'll stop after each section and ask for maybe a question or two. So if you have a burning uh, question from the content, which I'm sure you will, um, then share it. If you don't have a burning question, maybe we save it till the end and we can dismiss on time. And I'll stay after to answer any questions. How's that? Does that sound all right? Okay, and um, I'll stay after to answer any questions that we have. So, just kind of want to share some notes on race and racial healing. Um, about 80% of this content comes from um, a workshop that I went through about a four week, two, you know, four week in duration, two days a week, Tuesday, Thursday, from 6 to 8.30 p.m., a workshop that I went through on race and racial reconciliation. It, it was uh, sponsored by the Center for Racial Reconciliation out of Monrovia, out in Southern California, it's a Church Monrovia. Um, Pastor uh, John Jones, I believe his name is, is the um, author and his team of. You Google Church Monrovia or Monrovia, um, they're an amazing ministry that is really leading in their region in racial reconciliation. So <clears throat> I want to establish some, some, uh, some covenant and group norms for this for the rest of our time together, okay? So number one, and I've learned this in interacting with you all today, no one's a beginner. Everyone uh, who's here today is on a path to learn. And, and we're, I believe we're all working and praying to dismantle racism. So each of you should be respected for your place and your position on earth. Um, everyone's a teacher and a learner. You all have shared things with me that have been uh, edifying and educational. And each of us has something to teach and each of us has something to learn. Mutual respect and caring is asked for, for everyone. Next, we need to listen carefully to each other. Uh, likewise, we got to be willing to be uncomfortable in this process. Um, we've tried to make it as comfortable as possible. Um, put your seatbelts on. It could get a little bit more uncomfortable as we go. Okay, so we're, we're going to seek to create a brave and a safe space. Um, the subject of racism can be difficult. It's fueled with emotions and can really be uncomfortable. And so we encourage you to express your thoughts and feelings. We will not judge. One of the biggest issues I found in dealing with with issues of race is that my white brothers and sisters feel like if I say something, I'm going to be called a racist. If I say the wrong thing, I'm going to be called a racist. And in this safe and brave atmosphere, that will not happen. You have my word and we will not let it happen uh, as much as it depends on us and our, our, our time together today. <clears throat> and lastly, safe does not mean comfortable. So I, I think that um, we tend to say, I feel unsafe but we're really just uncomfortable. And, um, and so I really want to emphasize uh, that, that aspect as well. Uh, finally, we all have our own definition of what racism is, but in order to experience true and authentic reconciliation, we must have a common definition um, uh, of racism and reconciliation. 
And racism is a, it's a system, it's a structure that contains complex layers. It's something that permeates our day-to-day -day lives, but not easily visible to the eye. Racism is constantly evolving and not something that is easily defined. Um, we're able to see more clearly when we look through the lens of history, through scripture, and the intersection uh, of economics and race. So let's examine all of our preconceived notions uh, of racism and let's learn some tools to see it in a new way. I'm reminded of the scripture in Mark 8 and 18 where the writer says, do you have, uh, do you have eyes but fail to see and hear? Um, I'm sorry, and ears but fail to hear and don't you remember? Don't you remember? Joseph Brandt says this, if we wish to understand racism today, we must begin with history. So I want to just kind of recount a little bit of history. You have it in your handouts. Um, I won't read them. I won't insult your intelligence uh, by reading it to you because you all can read very well, I'm sure. But if you just kind of recount history from the European colonization and U.S. nation building to U.S. apartheid and colonization and neo-colonialism um, down to uh, 1954 through 73, uh, the movement time, uh, the, the period of civil rights movement and the Indian movements, the farm workers, La Raza, Yellow Power, and many other uh, people movements. Um, Ken Witzma says this. I want you to listen to this closely. I want you to think about this, and I'm going to ask you for some feedback. He says, a misunderstanding of the gospel leads to a false dichotomy. A misunderstanding of the gospel leads to a false dichotomy. Watch this. We prioritize the spiritual and the personal aspects of faith, and we devalue or nullify the material and communal dimensions um, that bind us to God's creation and to our brothers and sisters made in the image of God. This twisting of faith has resulted in historic injustices that have terrorized and handicapped generations of minorities. The result today is a society where we are deeply shaped by racial categories, yet we who are white remain mostly blind to how the undercurrent of racialized thinking affects our life as a nation and our actions it's from the myth of equality. One person give a comment on that and then we'll move on. One person have a thought. Anyone have a thought or a comment about the Witzma quote? It's a mouthful, says a lot. Yes, sir. We sure did. Yes. 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 One more. It does talk about a dichotomy, but it is a spiritual disease. It's where it begins and it affects. It's not separate from yes. it. affects how we work out on earth. Excellent. It begins. It is spiritual. Excellent. Spiritual evil. Good. How do scriptures inform us? Um, I don't know if anyone has your Bible or has access to a digital Bible, but I'd like to, to get two readers. Anyone have a Bible? Can I see your hand if you have access to a Bible? Yes, sir. Okay, there's, Father, tell me your name again, Father. Kirk. Kirk. Father Kirk has a Bible. It's a good thing that your, your leaders have Bibles. All right, anyone else have access to a Bible? Father Kirk, would you mind taking Acts 17, 24 through 28 for us? Acts 17, 24 through 28. Who else had a Bible? Okay. Your name? Julie. Julie, would you mind taking John 17, 20 through 23? Anyone else have a Bible? Yes, ma'am. Your name? Sandy. Sandy. Miss Sandy, would you take Galatians 3, 26 through 29? We're going to fire away in reading these scriptures, and we're going to uh, listen for 
how the scriptures inform us about race. What does scripture say about race and how does this inform our faith? Father Kirk, would you fire away? Yes. The God who made the world and hey, hey, wait a sec. Could you, could, could you who are going to read go to the mic? Yeah. Okay. Great. We can form a, a little line here and we can move as expeditiously as we can. Great. Thanks, sir. Acts 17, uh, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he, him, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Amen. Can our John 17 reader come? And let's have our Galatians reader just come right behind. Jesus prays for you, and I ask not only for these disciples, but also for all those who will one day believe in me through their message. I pray for them all to be joined together as one, even as you and I, Father, are joined together as one. I pray for them to become one with us so that the world will recognize that you sent me. For the very glory you have given to me, I have given to them, so that they will be joined together as one and experience the same unity that we enjoy. You live fully in me, and now I live fully in them, so that they will experience perfect unity, and the world will be convinced that you have sent me. For they will see that you love each one of them with the same passionate love that you have for me. Wonderful. Is it, are you starting to see a theme emerging here about race? Galatians 3, verses 26 through 29. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Amen. As we say in the Baptist church, may the Lord add a blessing, the reading, to the, the Lord add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, and most of all the doing of his word. Um, so just wanted you to have some scriptural foundation for um, race and, 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 and answer for yourself based on scriptures. And you're welcome to in your, in your meditation time, in your private time, in your study time, um, feel free to review the rest of these scriptures. Some of these you may be well, well, well familiar with. Um, but how does this, uh, how do these scriptures inform our faith? Uh, what does the scripture say <clears throat> about race? Um, Daniel Hill says the ideology of Christian colorblindness is fortified by theological truths that are unfortunately misapplied to cultural identity. He says the short form usually sounds something like this. God did not create multiple races. There's just one race, humankind. Anyone ever heard that before? Uh, as human beings, we share more in common than difference. We have all sinned. We're all in the need of redemption. We all are equals at the foot of the cross and through faith. We are all one in Christ. Every part of that 
sentence is theologically accurate. Sin, salvation, redemption um, are equally applicable to the people of every race and creed. Here's the problem. It is that those same truths are incorrectly applied to cultural identity, leaving us with a dangerous form of color blindness. So here's some manifestations of racism. Um, I'm gonna give you three of them. Um, power, one. Racism's power over people of color to control, hurt, oppress, and destroy. That's one manifestation of racism. Here's the second. A racism's power to preserve and maintain power and privilege for the white society. Here's the third definition of racism. Uh, racism's ultimate power to control and distort and destroy everyone. That's it in its extreme form. Um, I'd like for you in your, in your personal time to read these three manifestations of the misuse of power. They, they uh, elaborate on power one, power two, and power three. It's a summary of the definitions of racism. <clears throat> Uh, from Racial Equity Institute on Race. It says that race is a, is a specious, uh, intentionally deceptive, false look of truth. It's sociobiological class classification created by Europeans during the time of worldwide colonial expansion to assign human worth and social status using themselves as the model of humanity for the purpose of legitimizing white power and white skin privilege. From a definition by Dr. Uh, Mal Ma Malana Karenga. Uh, here's another facet of that. Prejudice, a judgment based on bias that stereotypes others as different. Uh, no one is free of prejudice, okay? And then it gives a definition of, of power, um, social and institutional. So it's access to resources, it's the ability to influence others, it's access to decision makers to get what you want done, it's the ability to define reality for yourself. Um, here's a definition of system. So we talk about systemic racism and systems and institutions, here we go. It's a set of things that together make a whole. It's an established way of doing something uh, such that things get done that way regularly and are assumed to be the normal way of getting things done. Meaning if someone does it differently, then it's not, it's not the right way. Uh, runs, it runs by itself, does not require planning or initiative by a person or groups. So when we talk about systems and systemic racism, these definitions are important. Systems and institutions um, in the United States were created originally and structured legally and intentionally to serve white people exclusively. Our banking system, our business system, our government, um, our media, television, um, education. Um, many of our main systems were set up with that construct. Uh, let's talk about advantage. It's uh, get to start the game on second base. It can be born into it, a, a, a step up uh, to be pushed or moved forward. So here's a term that makes some uncomfortable, and it is a term white priority. It's almost interchangeable with white pri uh, privilege. Um, white priority as white people, it says we can find positive role models, depictions in TV and newspaper. We're celebrated as heroes in most of our national holidays. Um, certainly the heroes that I saw growing up in school were Christopher Columbus and and all of these European uh, individuals, and I saw no one in my history lessons that looked like me, um, and, and I found out later on there was a whole lot of uh, contributors um, to the development of our nation besides Martin Luther King and besides um, some of the, 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 the handful that we saw that we learned about in, in U.S. history. As white people, we can attain college graduation, school, and find most professors 
look like us and talk like us. And most of our curriculum reflects our culture, um, history, and background. Told you all what it was like being the only black student in 90% of my classes at, at a predominantly white university. Uh, as white people, we can shop in most stores without being followed by a security guard or suspicion that we might be shoplifting. Y'all feel that? Um, yeah. Even today, as a 50-year-old man, uh, there are certain stores I walk in and I can tell that I'm being uh, followed or watched as if I might steal something. And I came in with a credit card and came in with money and I work just like anyone else who comes into the store. <coughs> As white people, we can easily find artists, depictions of God, Jesus, and other biblical figures that match our skin and facial char characteristics. <coughs> As white people, we can assume that anything with the label nude, uh, tights, tank tops, uh, what have you, uh, Band-Aids in the flesh, uh, uh, colored crayons, <coughs> all reflect our skin color, it's important for us to become aware of the ways the institutions uh, and the culture of our society continue to influence privilege and power. So following is a short list of examples of how white people experience power, priority, and privilege on a daily day basis. Study this and discuss it uh, in anything that you can, okay? <coughs> so, Priority A, can someone just read that out loud for us? A thing that is regarded as more important than another, the right to take procedure or to proceed before others. Excellent. Can someone read the next stanza for us? Oftentimes, some white people <coughs> get stuck on the term white privilege. The reality is white privilege is a phrase that, as white people, none of us are comfortable with. However, true reconciliation will not happen unless we're willing to confront head on the things that make us uncomfortable. Excellent. Can someone read the next paragraph? For the white person, the problem we often have with the term white privilege is that we do not really understand what it does and does not mean. We hear the word privilege, and many of us think, I might be white, but I'm certainly not I'm in debt, I don't make that much money, I'm still paying school loans, and nothing has been given to me. I've had to work hard for everything. Can you all relate to some of this? Yeah. All right. And so um, it says, uh, let's move on. Okay, let's go through those. Good. For yeah. those on Zoom, it would help if, uh, if you just power us through. Just power through so they can hear. Good, good. Okay. Okay, so here's a funny um, <clears throat> little caricature, if you will. Um, it says, uh, well, the, well, the one on the left says, uh, white privilege is your history, uh, is your history being part of the, I'm sorry, white privilege is your history being part of the core curriculum and mine being taught as an elective. <laughs> right? So... That can be a form of white privilege, like black history is an elective. You can take it or not take it, but European history is required. Um, you may agree or disagree. Um, it says, as a white male with a criminal record, uh, a white male with a criminal record, is 50, it should be 58, is 58% 58 more likely to get a job over a man of color with a clean record. It's a statistic. Okay, um, so here's a short summary of what white privilege does not mean. White privilege does not mean that white people do not work hard. It does not mean that white people never struggle. It does not mean that white people have it easier in their lives. And it does not mean that white privilege is a result of intentional discriminatory actions of white people. Okay, um, <clears throat> here's some manifestations. I want you all to get some insight into the mind of black Americans. Um, we're gonna call these IROs, or internalized um, racist oppression. Um, there are 
psych psychological manifestations of centuries of systematic racism that black people live with and deal with daily. You're going to find a very small margin of blacks who say, that's not the case. I'd never deal with that. Um, and that's great. That's fine. But you're going to find a majority of black folks who you talk to as you get to know them as you, and, and as you listen to them, we deal with this within a day to day level. So um, manifestations of I internalized racist oppression. It's a complex multi-generational socialization process that teaches people of color to believe, accept, and live out negative societal definitions of self uh, and fit into and live out inferior societal roles. These behaviors support and help maintain the race construct. And so uh, number one is self-doubt. Um, it's having a sense of inferiority to other human beings, uh, low self-esteem, and that is uh, it's a common hu human affliction. Distancing uh, from other people of color also creates a hierarchy, a hierarchy based on proximity to white norms. So we grew up in my day, if you were light-skinned, you were considered better. If you were light-skinned black, you were considered prettier. If you were light-skinned, you were considered near white. And in, in there's some mindsets that, that uh, my daddy used to say, Mr. Charlie's ice is colder than ours. In other words, the white man's ice is colder than our ice and that white is right. Um, <clears throat> and so as a result, there could be some distancing from other people of color and, um, and, and you find some blacks who just want to dissociate themselves from being black. Uh, Self-hate looks like doubt, uh, can also look like projecting one's own sense of inferiority and in, inadequacy onto others of the same race. This is where Ice Cube uh, wrote a song. Um, I won't say the first word of the song, but it's a derogatory word. And he says, basically, forget the police. But it's another F word, not forget. OK, uh, he's, he, it's a song against police. It came out in the, in the, in the, in the late 80s. And one of the lyrics of the song says um, he's talking about a black police officer. He's talking about all cops and he says, he'll slam you down to the street cop. I'm, I'm sorry, he'll slam you down to the street top, black police showing out for the white cop. In other words, here's a black police officer who hates black people um, because of this self-hate, because he grew up and maybe he experienced betrayal or abandonment by someone black in his family or what have you, or because of, uh, just roles, it's this internalized racist oppression. And now he wants to show his white uh, counterparts that I don't like blacks either. Or that I'll, I'll treat them as poorly as you do. Um, anger, rage, including uncontrolled, inappropriately expressed uh, uh, rage at, what white, at, at white people for their unwillingness or inability to be aware and take responsibility. Conversely, it can also manifest as putting white people on a pedestal. So you see the two extremes? Either I, you have black folks who have this internalized uh, racist oppression that either totally hate white people um, or they put white people on a pedestal and they feel like that whites are, are superior. Um, many, many African Americans uh, deal with that. There's exagger exaggerated visibility, a reaction to feeling invisible that racism creates uh, for people of color, often seen in exaggerated clothing. Sometimes you'll see uh, black folks who just dress extravagantly or they, um, they're, they're bright colors or pants hanging down or just um, um, what I would consider obtuse ways of dressing. Um, it c can sometimes come from a exaggerated visibility. It's a reaction to feeling invisible. And so since you don't see me, I'm going to dress how I want to dress. Since I'm insignificant in society, since I feel this internally, it's not necessarily a real thing. It's just something that they feel in their mind. So I'm going to uh, dress um, uh, uh, um, uh, extravagantly or in some way to draw attention to myself. Another internalized racist oppression uh, manifestation is acculturation assimilation uh, to the dominant culture. I think we kind of touched on that. You'll see some black folks want to lighten their skin. Uh, they give up their language. They don't talk uh, like their people from their neighborhood talk anymore. They talk, quote unquote, white. I've been accused of talking white. Um, you know, talking white 
meaning you you know good English and 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 proper congregate conjugation of your verbs and all of that, <laughs> and uh, anglic uh, anglicizing names and it's extreme denying one's own racial identity. They call it passing. Um, you got to get you got to pass to get the, to get that job in the in, with Wells Fargo or with Bank of America as an executive. <laughs> Um, colorism, prejudice or discrimination against those in the same ethnic or racial group with darker skin tone. We touched on that. A couple final manifestations are protectionism, protecting white people and their interest in the face of oppression because people of color are often rewarded for supporting whiteness and punished when they do not. So you'll see that in companies, on the job site, when um, discrimination is practiced or when something happens against a lower level black employee, you'll see another black employee try to protect white folks from what happened so that to the other black guy so that he maintains his position. In the slave times, we called that the house Negro and the field Negro. The house Negro was lighter complected because he was not out in the sun plowing and the house Negro was close to master and he would do anything to stay in good graces with the master, even if it even um, reinforce wrong done to the field Negroes. Does that make sense? All right. Um, uh, lastly, or second to last rather, ethnocentrism, believing in the intrinsic superior of the culture or group to which one belongs, often accompanied by feelings of dislike for other groups. I've heard uh, people say that Jesus is black just to try to, you know, um, really uplift um, the black race and to try to ascribe some type of ethnocentrism to their faith. Um, um, I've, I've seen uh, black folks who manifest this internalized racial oppression um, as, as lifting up the black race and black power, which I'm for, I, I believe in empowerment, black empowerment, but not at the not at the ostracizing of other groups. Does that make sense? And so uh, you'll see that as well. Uh, victimhood, always seeing oneself as a victim and denying one's own power to transform a situation. I call it apathy. Um, I preach against it in my church and in my community. I've been criticized for being harsh and hard, but I do, I do not like the victimization um, that we sometimes see in the black race. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I believe the Bible gives us a lot of reason to, 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 to stand against that. Uh, exceptionalism, the belief that racism doesn't exist because some people of color are successful and consequently, if one is uh, not, then there's something wrong with that person, not the system. Um, uh, black folks who start at the bottom and work their way up and become successful often take on that role. It is that I made it so you should be able to make it. And not ever uh, acknowledging that there is systemic barriers and blockages that hold uh, some, uh, some, some, some folks back. Not to say they, that, that, that they couldn't achieve, but it's that arrogance of uh, I made it so you ought to be able to make it kind of a deal. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, Does that also come from the white culture saying that you, my black friend, made it, so you, my black friend, you should get it. It yeah. comes that way too, right? Yes. We use it as a... Absolutely. Absolutely. It, 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 that exonerates me from ever having to acknowledge and do anything about systemic racism. I can say, well, look, Johnny, look at Johnny. He's, he, you know... He's, he, 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 he did it. You ought to be able to do it, right? <clears throat> Were you saying something, honey? You keeping me on track? Push through. I only have 15 minutes left. All right. All right. All right. All right. So um, how about we push through? We want to be here. Ha, 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 ha. Father Matt, I'm following your lead here. You tell me what to do. I want to push through. So, um, all right. So um, here's, some, here's some other manifestations of internalized. Well, let me, let me backtrack. So there's another term 
called in internalized racist superiority. This is often ascribed to the white race. It's a complex multi-generational socialization process that teaches white people to believe and accept and live out superior social definitions of self and to fit into and live out superior societal roles. Uh, these behaviors define and normalize the race construct and its outcome, hence white privilege. So silence is one. S avoiding conflict, refusing to discuss difficult topics, often when others express racist ideas. I have some friends that when issues of racism comes up, they go silent. They just don't say anything. They're thinking a whole lot, but they don't say it. Uh, white numbness, shutting down and checking out when experiencing emotional conflict around race, okay? So I'm just kind of numb to it. I'm just gonna, eh, not gonna get into it. Uh, denial, amnesia, feeling it's not my problem because I'm not a racist. Uh, that happened a long time ago. I didn't own any slaves, right? So these are uh, attitudes we have to watch for. They're internalized racist superiority or can be deemed as such. You may disagree with some of these, and that's fine. Uh, colorblind, it is a form of denial as in I don't see color. I don't see that Johnny's black. Uh, I don't know how you couldn't. As black as I am standing up here, I don't know how y'all <laughs> could not see that. Uh, <laughs> um, I did... <laughs> Amen. Amen. And that's kingdom. That's, that's biblical. Um, identity threat, disorientation when learning of one's whiteness and lack of uniqueness or specialness uh, and unearned privilege. Okay. A white deflection, fragility, if you will. Uh, it is actions or words designated to shut down conversations by crying, physically leaving, emotionally withdrawing, arguing, denying, focusing on intentions, rather than impact, um, and then seeking abs absolution or avoiding. Another one is defensiveness. I just said one little thing, right? Yes, yes. Uh, Self-proclaimed allies, a belief of superiority by being one of the good white people, okay? Um, white shame, the fear that being white is bad which can lead to overwhelming guilt, shame, and paralysis. We certainly don't want that. A white savior approaching the work from a position of power in order to save people of color uh, rather than working on the problem itself. I call it the white messiah. And we've had that in our community where folks come alongside to help and they um, at some point start to feel like I'm rescuing you guys. And it becomes a white savior uh, uh, complex. Right to comfort, the, the belief or, or feeling that comfort is the same as safety, feeling threatened when discussing race and racism. Um, what are some next steps? And we're just about finished here. What are some next steps? Um, yes. Just to, just to check, is anybody, is any, outside of me, my daughter's leaving and we have to go to the airport, but outside of Matt and Carrie, is everybody okay if Johnny goes 15 minutes long? Oh, yeah. Everybody's okay? Okay, okay great. Yeah. Just raise your finger, though. Yeah, if you have to have All right. Yeah, you got it. You got it. You got it. You got to tip out. Don't draw attention to yourself now. <laughs> All right. So, um, what are my next steps? So, an event has happened upon which it's difficult to speak. And it's impossible to remain silent, Edmund Burke says. But do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now. Love mercy now. Walk humbly now. You are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. Um, so the author Jones suggests that when we interface with and come into contact with the reality of racism and how it's affected our nation, that we should consider a time of lament. That sometimes, uh, according to Psalms 13 and 1, um, we should just lament. We should mourn. And it's not 
a morning where we sit up and cry and become emotional. It's just a solemn place of, of, of being very pensive, being very thoughtful, and just being sad. It, it is a biblical expression of healing to lament, to mourn. Of course, Jesus says in the Beatitudes, blessed uh, are, are those who, who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And so um, it's okay to mourn what we've seen. It's okay to mourn the division. It's okay to mourn the political discord that we've seen. It's okay to mourn our differences, and, and, and it's okay to mourn what we've seen uh, happen in our nation. Um, and so uh, there are some components of, 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 of lamenting that I want to just share with you very quickly. It is, uh, number one, to worship. Okay, um, here's another aspect of it is description. Another aspect of lamenting is connection. And I won't go into them for the sake of time. Um, another aspect of lamenting is repentance. Uh, next aspect of mourning is confession. And another aspect of lamenting is petition where we invoke God and ask him. Uh, we cry out for his intervention and his mercy. And we trust. We express our trust in God because of who he is and remembrance of God's past saving. And finally, we praise. We offer thanksgiving and praise to God for who God is and what he has done. We offer praise and trust that God can and will bring change. I'd like to take 30 seconds. And if you need to look at your paper, fine. But I'd like to just lament um, for the next 30 seconds over what we have encountered, interfaced, and experienced in our nation concerning race and racism. Amen. If you notice, what I did not do was give you strategy or try to give you strategy, <clears throat> practical application on what Trinity Episcopal should do. Um, I believe that for each ecclesia, for each congregation, God will give st strategy and will give steps. I think once the spirit has been um, transformed, and once our thinking has been transformed and we see ourselves as called to be on mission for racial reconciliation, um, we all, you, you, you will begin to see where God is moving and where you are to plug in and if you can't see then that's the time to follow good leadership because you have, you, you have leaders here who can see what Trinity's next steps and practical application should be. And so it's, it's my hopes that um, though I have not been exhaustive in everything that can be stated and said, uh, and shared around racial reconciliation and where we are. I just hope to have planted a seed that can be watered, um, that your leaders here can continue to water. Apostle Paul said, one plants, another waters. God gives the increase. I sense that there's probably some of you who already have ideas and, wow, I know this person and what if we implemented this ministry? And I heard Father Matt say we might do this. And 
wow, I see a role, I have something that I bring to the table, or there may be someone who says, you know, I really don't see where I fit in, but just hang around and just pray and, and watch God begin to um, mobilize you. You, you, you might, everyone in my church, even though we're in the streets, we're feeding, we're serving, we're um, doing a lot of programs, after school programs. Everyone in our congregation is not called to do that work, but they are called to do something. And so maybe it's to pray, maybe it's to write a check, maybe it's to make a phone call and make a connection, maybe it's to be hands on uh, in mentoring and in meeting basic needs of those who are less fortunate, whatever that calling is, many of you have years in, of experience in doing ministry and in serving others. And so it will all come together very beautifully. And God's going to do great things through this ministry. And I feel like family, so now y'all have a new uh, black church member uh, uh, all the way from Houston, Texas. And uh, it's been my pleasure to get to share with you. So I want to open it up for um, questions. I want to open it up for comments, yes. And by the way, in this section here, anything you want to discuss um, within the confines of racial reconciliation and healing is fair, fair game. So I think we could all agree that as a country, we're relatively integrated. Now, I'm not talking about equity, but we all shop in the same places, we ride the same buses, um, we can be together, we're integrated. Can you reflect why it is that Christian churches in this day are the most segregated places? <laughs> so, so <clears throat> Yes, the question is, given how integrated we are as a society in, in business sectors and in other secular spheres, why is it that in the church, in the body of Christ, we are so um, segregated? You know, I may not be the most outspoken person on that subject, um, but I do believe that historically, as a nation, um, and as a people, and sociologically, people are most comfortable around those who look like them. Um, when the African American church, um, after emancipation and slaves, you know, were not allowed to read, we were not allowed to, to, to um, uh, learn how to read and that kind of thing, so as a result, we couldn't read the Bible um, when we became free, we were able to read, we were able to gather, we were able to assemble, we were able to do church uh, as a people, and there was this total evolution of Negro spirituals and this entire culture that we call the black church. And I think that that um, grew and spread and had so many different offshoots, um, and we still call it to this day the black church. Um, and there are some cultural underpinnings and some very distinguishing characteristics of the black church that I don't, I don't see black people letting go of. <laughs> You're welcome to come and experience the black church. And don't, don't get me wrong, we're a diverse body. There are some black-led churches where, um, that are multi-ethnic. You see more on the other side of the coin. You see very few whites who will come and submit and serve at a black-led church. However, you see tons of black folks fleeing from black churches to go, in, to go participate and serve in white-led churches. And there are reasons for that. There are lots of reasons for that. Um, maybe, Father Matt, perhaps you have more insight on, on why we're so segregated on Sunday mornings. But that's, that's about all that I have. I think you summed it up pretty well. Yeah. What's that? You summed it up pretty well. OK, OK. Which quote? Oh, the one by. Um, 
So there's a quote by Desmond Tutu. I'm going to mess it up, but I'm going to give it a shot anyways. He says, when white missionaries showed up, we had the land and they had the Bibles. They said, let us pray. We closed our eyes and prayed. And when we opened them, they had the land and we had the Bible. And so, and so there is there, and I, that was almost verbatim. That was pretty good. Uh, <laughs> there is some, there is some, and this is a transparent moment for us as people, as believers, that there is some feeling in the spiritual DNA of black Christians that, um, that white, early white Christians used religion to oppress us, to enslave us. Um, and that there are certain scriptures about slaves obey your masters and all that that was used to, to um, prolong and justify uh, the slave stuff. And so I think there's some us over here and them over there kind of dynamics that work as well. I saw a hand. Yeah. Yes. And uh, at the uh, election of Jimmy Carter, or Jimmy Carter, um, <laughs> Martin Luther King Sr. spoke at the Lincoln Memorial, and part of what he said was, Jesus said, feed my sheep, tend my lambs, feed my sheep, and y'all been too busy fleecing the sheep. <laughs> <laughs> I never will forget Dr. King Sr. reminding us that's the sin that we have committed. Amen. Amen. Um, I think I saw, whose hand was up first? I don't want to, okay. I see your hand, sir, and then your hand. Hey, um, quick comment. Um, going back to colorblind, to that term, I think, because that's something that, um, the comment that I don't see color, you know, I see you as my brother. I think the, the question that I've learned from my black friends is, you know, how do you want to be seen as a black man and as a black woman? And as in the answer I've received is, you want us as your white friends to see your black identity, your black culture, your blackness as part of being our brother and sister. Yes. So could you just elaborate a little bit more on, on that from your point of view? I think that would help. That's a good question. Um, so I can't speak for all blacks, but I uh, love what my sister said here, which is, I see you as a brother in Christ. I think that's first and foremost. I am a Christian uh, disciple of Christ, a follower of Jesus Christ, um, before I am an African-American man. Um, that has preeminence. My faith has preeminence over my, over my skin color and over my culture. Um, at the same time, it would be, um, I think, um, impossible to have a relationship with me and to know me and to love me without loving my blackness and without loving the 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 Person. yes and you love cry feel fear hunger the same as I do yes mothers we share the same feelings we are alive yeah there is no difference except Yes. Yes. I, I would say I. I'm going to give you something to disagree about. Um, <laughs> I want you to see me as a black sister, because if you don't see my black, you don't see my pain. If you don't see my black, you don't see my heritage, and you don't see why I am the way that I am in some ways. Because although we have so much in common, and you're right, uh, we have so much in common. I'm a mother, you're a mother, I, I love Jesus, you love Jesus. But the truth is that our pains are different, especially in this culture. And so my black son lives a, a life that's really different than your white son. And that's, and, and, and the love of a mother is the same though, but the fear of a mother may be a little different. 
You get what I'm saying? And so I want you to see all of that. I want you to see the pain so that you can understand me. And so that when we do come into situations like this, you know Janice's story, you know Johnny's story, and you know what they've been through. And the same, as the same, we should know you. Because if I, if I, um, if we don't, if we don't see that, that color blind, that's going to keep us from understanding each other in a, on a deeper level. And we should not, as Christians, we should not, but as society, we cannot be blind to the barrier. We cannot be blind to that. Because... Start with me, and society will change. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I just think that it's, I, I think when, when that question is posed, I, I want you to see me as a black sister. Sister being, I'm your sister, but I am also your black sister. That would be like, um, I have, a, I have a, a, a very close white friend and, and her son is black. And she knows that fear because her son is black. You get what I'm saying? She knows, and she lives that fear, and she went on Facebook and did a whole Facebook post about her white friends not understanding that she has a different kind of fear because she has a adopted black son, you know? And I think that's the same thing with, um, uh, when it comes to the quote that you said, that you said about uh, the scriptures being true, that we shouldn't see that we're all one, but then on the other side, needing to make sure that we do, that it's misapplied, right, right, to, to our culture. Yeah. I, need help, I need help getting the first hand to speak first. It was mine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to help watch. I'm going to help watch. I thought I, I, thought I saw over here. I, I know I saw a hand here and then back there. I think. Okay. What is repentance and reconciliation? Can I take that one after the question back here? If we can just feel that, just table that, just just for one second, because I want to do, I want to give respect to the person here that had, yes, yes, yes. Um, drugs <clears throat> seem to have a negative impact in the black community, mm -hmm. negative impact impact in the white community. But yeah. From your own experience, the impact of drugs. Yeah. Um, I think Mr. Floyd had a background of drugs and issues in that regard. Yes. What can be done? And I, and I, well, not what can be done, because you're doing some of it in your development of youth. And, and how do, do you see that trend growing, and what can be done to eliminate the gangs and the drugs, predominantly in the black community, but also in the white community? Yes. It's when, our, it's when we stop criminalizing substance abuse and, and addiction. When, 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 when crack cocaine um, hit the black community. Um, we were charged, sentenced, and convicted 10 times more harshly than when our white counterpart, who was busted with powder cocaine, um, went, to, went before the judge. These are statistics, criminal justice department statistics. And so when the black person has cocaine, he's, it's criminal. When someone else has cocaine, it's a health issue. And so um, we want to not criminalize substance abuse. Now I want to, now trust me, I put some people in jail in from my community too. I've shut down crack houses. I put drug dealers in jail. I say I, but we have collectively in our community, we, we, we want to rid ourselves of the crime. But I also ran a 50 bed transitional home for men coming out of pr prison out of drug treatment to help people get, you know, so I think it's, it's, it is us um, uh, uh, dealing with the systemic issues of the criminal justice system, how we criminalize it in the black community, we heavily police it, but then when 
methamphetamines and opiates hit the white community, oh, now we've got to get some legislation in place to get these kids some help. But over here, when it's cocaine and crack, these guys, look at these criminals over here. We got to we got to get we got to put these guys in jail. We got to get the three strikes you're out going for these guys over here. You follow me? And so I think that's one aspect. Also, it's education. It's 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 that when my daughter was in the fifth grade in the hood, which we tried to live in the hood and serve in the hood. And my daughter was not coming home with homework. And I said, why you don't where's your homework? Dad, I don't have any. So I asked her weeks went by. You don't have any homework. So I went up to the school and I went to her English teacher, Miss Carter. I said, Miss Carter, why doesn't Jayla have any homework? And she dropped her head and said, because Mr. Gentry, we don't have copy paper. Copy paper. I was livid. I went to the principal's office and met with Dr. Angie, anyways, can't think of her last name. And she's a friend of mine. And I said, please tell me, Dr. Angie Allen, please tell me. What I just heard isn't true, that the reason my fifth, my fifth grader doesn't have homework is because y'all don't have copy paper? She said, Pastor Gentry, it's true. And so how come, how come, the, kids, how come the kids in Memorial, on the west side of town, every student has a laptop? And we don't have copy paper. Is it because the tax base doesn't? You know, we, we poverty here. And then, so to me, that seems to not make sense. Who's paying attention to this? Why is equity, the word you use, my friend, why is equity not happening here, but it's, but it's abundance over here? So those are issues, in my view, criminal justice, education, um, uh, uh, poverty. Those are issues that I think need to be addressed from within the black community, we gotta do what we've been doing. We've been preaching in the churches against drug addiction and against drug use. Uh, we raise our children uh, to, to know uh, that marijuana is a gateway drug for other drugs. And I mean, we, we, the black community, I feel like we're doing as much as we know to do, but when it's systemic, it's like putting a Band-Aid on a gaping wound from a community-wide standpoint. Does that make sense? You know, you, you, you have, you know, we, we, we love the Lord, we're teaching, uh, all the things that we know to teach and, 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 and to, to raise our children right. You have some families who are a part of generational poverty and they never saw a man get up and go to work in their house, ever. They, it's always been a single mom and it's always been food stamps and public assistance. And so that's all they've ever. Mm -hmm. And a part of that, you know, even with the welfare fair system, when we talk about systematic or systemic um, bondage, uh, when there was a need in the black household for help from the government, they would not give a black family help. They would only give the black mother help. So you could not be a black woman with a man in the house and receive food stamps. That's, that's systemic. You had, they would, they would, there is still systems in place today where they will come to a black woman's home to check to make sure that there's not a black man living in the home. And so, and so in, in order to get housing, in order to get assistance, you know, and so, and so in so many ways it will help you, but then we're going to, yeah, it, right, exactly. And so then you wonder why we have a lot of, <laughs> single single parent homes and things like that some of it is systemic some of it is not because we don't have good black men some of it is because there's been a breakdown of the black family um in culture that if you are a whole black family then you don't get some of the privileges that you know a single a single family home would get and so then you had women thinking okay well i won't marry the man I'll just have a boyfriend or I won't, you know, you can live in another home and the kids will live with me and we'll, you know, so it's, it's so deep and we, we, I would love for us to come back because we didn't get to touch on a lot of the uh, things with you guys. I would love that if we were able to come back and talk about some of those things. And as Johnny was even going through all of the internal lies, uh, racist, uh, 
racist oppression. There are things that are done in culture that causes that internal um, op oppression for black people. Number one, um, I want you guys, when we leave here, go to the Walmart. And I want you to go to the, to the toy owl, owl. I want you to go where the toys are. And I want you to see how many black dolls are in the, in the, in the, in the aisles, how many black baby dolls. And so our young black girls grew up thinking, hey, I'm not pretty. I'm not, I'm not good enough. I don't have anything reflecting who I am. So I must not be good enough. And so those are things that, that are done that my little girl, I had, we had, <laughs> when my kids were young, we had to buy white dolls. And that's all that they saw until we have now, we have creatives that are creating more black dolls and we're getting in stores and things like that. But those are some of the things um, that, you know, when you leave here, look for those things and think about, hey, maybe some of the things that we're not seeing, you know, blatant, let's look a little bit deeper into these things to see how it's affecting uh, the black community. And so, th yeah, that was a great Poverty exacerbates drug addiction, and it be just becomes a vicious cycle. One of the biggest uh, indicators in the community between you know the wealth gap. So, just if anybody know, take a guess. What's the average net worth of wealth of white families in America? Does anybody know? Average net worth? Average net worth? One hundred fifty thousand dollars. One hundred fifty, one hundred fifty-five thousand dollars is the average net worth. Of families, you might know what the net average net worth of black families in America is about seven thousand oh. dollars. And so, and, and why is that? so the, the the biggest the biggest indicator or variable between the wealth gap in black and white families in America is home ownership. It's home ownership. And what were the problems with black people getting homes during Jim Crow? Yeah, well, even even up to the '60s, it, it's that it's that yeah it's that banks were incentivized not to loan to blacks uh, for for home ownership. Yes, yeah. So every black fan, every black generation is starting from ground, is starting from scratch, as opposed to I mean it seems very commonplace um, to those who haven't lived that um, that you pass on homes, you pass on money. You pass on businesses to your kids, and every generation in our starts from starts from scratch. So that's not the black people still can buy homes, but it, it has been a, even up through 1968. I think Elizabeth Warren or someone, not to get political, but she was on the Senate floor arguing. We've got there's still some legislation a couple years ago that in certain parts of the country that that incentivized banks not to loan to blacks, and she was. She was kind of touting that. And so that's been an issue. Um, and then the poverty. And I just think that there are some mindsets and mentalities in the black community that, that the black folks are responsible to break and to speak to and to preach to and to empower and equip. And uh, we have to um, really preach truth about not being dependent on government. We have to continue to preach the truth. My mama taught me, which is that if you love God, and you work hard, you can do anything that you, that you put your mind to. You can overcome barriers. You can overcome racism. Don't let that be an excuse. Do what you must do. Work very hard. Be educated. Um, trust God, and you can, you can, you can achieve uh, success. And so, um, great question. Any other questions? What time are we? Two, two. Let's do Mignon's question. Yes. Mm -hmm. So repentance in the Greek means to do a 180. Means to do, you know, people say, I did a complete turnaround. You just went right back to the same thing. <laughs> I did a 360. <laughs> no, you don't want to do a 360. You're back in the same path. You want to do a 180. So, so repentance, it literally, it literally means a 180. It means to do an about face. And so when it comes to racial healing and racial reconciliation, it means, you know what? I was thinking this way. But once I became enlightened with truth, 
And once I had an epiphany or a revelation, or once I got educated and equipped, read a couple books, what have you, I'm doing an about face. I'm doing a 180. I'm going the opposite direction that I, that I was headed in. Um, I heard my brother, uh, is he still here? The one who marched. Yeah, tell me your name again, sir. Bob. Bob. Yeah, he said he was raised in a part of Florida where, where he was raised up in bigotry and racism. And when he got to college and left home, he decided that he was going to do the opposite. And he made the only black um, seminary student in his seminary, he made him his, his best friend. Um, that's a 180. Reconciliation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, repentance. We express deep sorrow for the sins and travails of our people and desire to change. Uh, if only we knew the power of your anger, your wrath. Is as great, uh, is as great as the fear that is your due. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Psalms 90, 11, and 12. And reconciliation is the same kind of reconciliation. Uh, racial reconciliation. Racial reconciliation is the same kind of reconciliation that we see biblically. It is where I believe it's Second Corinthians uh, nine. I could be a verse or two off, 9 and 12, but it says, for God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing our trespasses against us, but he's given us the message of reconciliation. And I think racial reconciliation aligns itself with that truth. It is that um, because God forgave us for our sins, that I dare not hold any race or any people group or anyone hostage to their sins, whether it's as a people, as a race, as a culture. And, 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 um, uh, and, and as you said, God has, and I realize that God has entrusted me now with the message of reconciliation, being restored, having fellowship restored, um, or having um, relationship uh, restored. And now we move together on mission um, to, to Yes, forgetting, yes, not imputing our trespasses against us, right, forgetting what is past, and now we're on mission together with a message, with a mandate, with a ministry to bring reconciliation through Jesus Christ to everyone that we can, anyone who will listen. I believe that's reconciliation. Great question. Uh, do you, are you online? Do you, do you have a page or whatever? Yes, yes, freeindeedchurch.org. As in John 8 and 36. Now, I don't talk like this on my sermons now. I'm talking to y'all real nice. I'm a Pentecostal uh, preacher in the South. And I, I'm talking to y'all as nice as I can. <laughs> uh, um, freeindeedchurch.org. John 8 and 36, whom the Son makes free is free indeed. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, ma'am. several verses of different emphasis. Psalm 22 means a whole lot to me because it changed a lot of my spiritual mm -hmm. life. Yeah. When, I, when I first read it, I was an adult. <laughs> I'd been a minister's wife for quite a while. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it begins with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which were Jesus' words from the cross. That had always bothered me about why would he feel that way. And by reading all the way through the whole psalm, and several of these instances bring that out, it talks about what's actually happening to Jesus at the time on the cross. So when he said that, he was really in a way to me saying to everyone who could hear and anyone who has read it since. This is what I'm going through, but the end of the story is down listed under praise. Mm -hmm. So he may not have had strength to read, to say the whole psalm, but anybody that knew the psalm knew that the end of the story is the whole world would be reconciled. And so under this whole idea 
one of the things that has occurred to me, we have a we have two grandchildren. One is both adopted by the same blonde daughter. One from China, and one who was a mixed black uh, ethnic situation. And both of them consider themselves women of color and have been recently, because of this, we have been able to begin some family conversations that have just been very instrumental in the relationship that we have with these two young women as grandparents that we never had before. And so we're really grateful that even out of all of this awfulness, we have an open window now of understanding between two of our grandchildren life, especially at our age, this is a, where we should begin, one-on-one, -on -one within our family. And so it's just really been helpful. That is beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Amazing. You got a final word? I love y'all. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, my, my, my final word would be um, to hear the voice of God. Um, he says that my sheep know my voice and a stranger they will not follow. They will not hear. And I think each of us has to hear the voice of God through all of the content that you've received. Um, and sometimes when it's a challenge to hear the voice of God um, for what I, what I should be doing, what, what, Lord, what do you want me to do? Um, you know, God is the God who invites. In the Old Testament, he's, you know, I'm God, you're my people. Uh, I will walk among you. I'll be in you. I'll be your God. And then comes in New Testament and says you're a, you're a royal priesthood. You're a, you're a holy nation um, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. And so um, each of us has a, the ability, the priesthood of the believer, the ability to go forth in our respective callings and ministries, whatever that is. And I think it's so vital that we hear the voice of God and what we should be doing. And when I cannot hear, when, I, when I'm unclear, then I can trust the voice of God through the scriptures, through my still small voice, through the shepherds and leaders that he's placed in my life. And um, I just, I, I believe in Father Matt Marino and his leadership and his heart, and I believe, in, and just met uh, uh, Father Kurt, and I believe in the leadership. I sense God here in this, in this church, and I believe that you all will, like my mom used to say, we will all come out where we're supposed to. We will all come out where we're supposed to. So that's my final word. We love you. I just, I just wanted to say that I love you guys. And the love in this church is amazing. The warmth here, me and Johnny talked about it. The warmth here is amazing. And we really do feel like we have brothers and sisters here in, in Florida. So thank you, Father Matt. Thank you, guys. We appreciate you, and we love you so much. You guys, thank you so much for coming. Can you just give them a hand today? Great. And the good news is you get more Johnny because he's preaching tomorrow. Yeah, we, we want the real deal. Yeah, we, we want, hang on, hang on, hang on. Bruce, don't, don't give it away yet. We, we want the real deal, just, just the, the Episcopal time length version of it. <laughs> so, so you go, you go, just don't keep going. <laughs>
go. Yeah, I, I preached at a black church once. Yeah, once. I thought I was preaching my face off. Like, I was going, man, I, this is going so well. And in the back, a lady stands up and says, help him, Jesus. So on our way out the door, I just want to leave you with Psalm 89, verse 14. The pillars of the Lord's throne are righteousness and justice. Steadfast love and faithfulness are his. Righteousness, our our walk with God. And justice, our walk in the world. And they go hand in hand. One of them's not the gospel. Both of them together are. And together, we're going to walk out the stuff that's been going on, and we're going to walk it out with our neighbors. We're going to walk it out with the other churches, all of them. And so the, the beauty of this is, um, is we just, the, the angst of the culture happened at a really strange time, at the time when bridge building between clergy in a way that Father Tom, who grew up here, tells me has never happened before. And, and uh, we were having a conversation over coffee three weeks ago, and he said, gosh, I've tried to get clergy together forever and had just kind of given up on it, and then you guys all show up and actually want to hang out together. <laughs> and, and so um, I, I can just tell you the Basilica, Hunter over at, at, uh, at Memorial, um, I, I know um, Walter at, at Anastasia, and, and Dr. Melvin Kennerly at St. Paul AME, there is a wonderful unity building among the clergy and a desire to work together for the shalom of God in St. Augustine and, and, uh, and in St. John's County. And it's a really, it's, it's a wonderful and beautiful thing. And we get to, in humility, be a part of it. You know, it's, it's not our work, it's the Lord's work. But we have our little part to do in it. So, um, so, Lord, thank you for Johnny and Janice and their ministry. Thank you for a long obedience in the same direction. Thank you for the work you've called them to put their hands to um, in the work of serving you, in the work of serving one another, in the work of loving and serving their kids. Lord, thank you that, that their kids are on mission for you in the places you've put them. Lord, we pray that, pray that you would bless them and protect them. And Lord, we pray for the ministry that they're doing. We pray that you would continue to grow it, that you would multiply it, that you would use even, even tragedy to grow their ministry. Lord, Lord, even COVID and the, the murder of George Floyd, that, that you have brought beauty out of those ashes in Northeast Houston. Lord, we pray that you would continue to work for your goodness in that place. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.